Members, I have to announce that the following communication from His Excellency the Governor General has been received. I desire to inform the House of Representatives that I received a letter dated 28 August 1989 from the Honourable Joan Child MP tending, tendering her resignation as Speaker of the House of Representatives and that I have accepted her resignation. Accordingly, I invite the House to elect a new Speaker. Signed, Bill Hayden. Government House, Canberra, 28 August 1989. The next business is the election of Speaker. I call the Honourable Member for Lindsay. Mr Browning, I move that Mr Maclay do take the chair of this House as Speaker. The Member for Dovell. I have pleasure in seconding the nomination. Is there any further proposal? Yeah. You, do you want to do you want to do your little chat first, do you? No. Does the member for Grandler accept the nomination? Okay. No. I, I do, Mr. Clark. <laughs> the leader of the opposition. Uh, Mr. Clark, uh, I uh, move that Mr. Rocher do take the uh, chair. Yeah. Take the chair of this house as uh, speaker. The leader of the National Party. I uh, second the nomination that Mr Roach should take the chair. <laughs> Is there any further proposal? The time for proposals has expired. I call the uh, mover of the first motion, the member for Lindsay. Mr Browning, the Prime Minister this morning, in paying tribute to the honourable member for Henty, said that she had made history and made history well. It is my honour this afternoon to nominate as her successor the person who has been at her right hand for the past three and a half years, the Honourable Member for Grainler. Since his election in June 1979, the Honourable Member for Grainler has made an outstanding contribution to this House. I mentioned two areas of his service. First, on the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Expenditure, a committee on which the Honourable Member for Grainler served between the years 1979 and 1986. He was that committee's deputy chairman from 1981 to 1983 and its chairman from 1983 to 1986. Secondly, the Honourable Member for Grainler has served this House as its chairman of committees and its deputy speaker from February 1986. The position of Speaker demands a thorough knowledge of the standing orders, the rules and procedures of this House. The Honourable Member for Grainler has demonstrated a sound record in this area, both on the occasions when he's occupied the chair as the Deputy Speaker and as Acting Speaker, he's applied the rules fairly and firmly. The position also requires sound administrative ability. Along with Mr President, the Speaker is responsible for the running of the Parliament. On the occasions in which he's acted in that role, the Honourable Member for Grainler has performed those duties well. Third, the position of Speaker requires representational skills of a high order. And on the many occasions when the Honourable Member for Grainler has represented the Parliament, both here and overseas, he has performed that role with diligence and with distinction. Fourth, the position of Speaker requires a commitment to the committee system of this House. I've mentioned the Honourable Members for Grindler's service on the Expenditure Committee, and certainly during his period as Chairman, the inquiries have been relevant to the needs of contemporary Australia. There have also been important inquiries, and I mentioned just one, the inquiry into nursing homes. The report of the committee was entitled In a Home or At Home. And that inquiry led to the establishment of the government's home and community care program. Under the Honourable Member for Grainler, that committee was truly an exercise of taking the parliament to the people. 
The honourable member for Graindler was also responsible in 1987 for the development of the first comprehensive committee system for the House of Representatives. That committee system works well and it owes its success to the honourable member for Graindler. He offers experience and a proven record in all of those four areas. But in addition, he will bring to the position a loyalty to and love of this institution. For not only in his period of service has he developed an interest in a wide range of policy areas, but he also has a close interest in the way the institution works and its traditions. I recall some years ago in a discussion with the uh, Leader of the House, the Leader of the House referred to the Honourable Member for Graindler as the parliamentarian's parliamentarian, and that truly sums up his commitment to this institution. In many ways, the position of Speaker is the loneliest job in this place. The Speaker frequently faces unique pressures and must face them alone. He must interpret the atmospherics of the House and move to a swift resolution of those pressures. The Honourable Member for Grainler will bring to this task a wealth of experience, a proven capacity for judgment, authority and determination and a commitment to the parliament. But above all, he will bring to the position great personal warmth. For we all have in the Honourable Member for Graindler, on both sides of the chamber, a person who will serve the House with distinction and in friendship and in the highest traditions established by his predecessors. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Clark, uh, it is uh, with pleasure that we nominate uh, the Member for Curtin, Alan Rocher, for the position of Speaker. There are certain harsh realities about politics, and uh, one of them one of them, as I commence these remarks, uh, is the reality that the weight of numbers seems to be on the other side. But if, but if, in, uh, this, if in this historic, uh, if on this historic occasion where the first woman uh, speaker retires, there could be equally some historic movement uh, in the amorphous blob of the caucus to consider the arguments, you would find that the weight of the argument in favour of Mr Rocher outweighs the argument in favour of the member for Grainler. Yeah. The, member, uh, the member for Curtin was elected, uh, of course, as a senator from Western Australia in 1977. He resigned in 1981 and was elected to the seat of Curtin at a by-election on the 21st of February 1981 and, of course, has retained the seat since then. Uh, he, has, he has, of course, uh, been a significant contributor to debates in this House. He has served both Houses with distinction, has long experience in committees in, the, in, the, in another place as well as here. He uh, has served on the Senate Committee uh, on Privileges, on uh, Legislative and General Purpose, on the House Standing Committee on Standing Orders, on the Joint uh, Public Accounts Committee and has been a most distinguished Deputy Chairman of Committees in this House since April of 1983. I recall that on one occasion uh, the Honourable Member for Menzies was nominating, on a previous occasion, Mr Rocher, and uh, he, uh, he referred back to the qualities that a former Speaker, Speaker Sneddon, uh, defined as necessary for uh, uh, occupying the position of Speaker. I have to say to you, a cursory examination of those qualities reveals to me that only Mr Rocher would qualify of all members in the parliament, but I will remind you of what they were. Integrity, judgment, common sense, firmness, patience, impartiality, tact, a sense of humour, self-confidence, presence of mind and, above all, Firmness tempered with kindness. <laughs> Nothing more befits the member for Curtin Moore, and with the greatest respect to the member for Grainler, he runs second on every test. Alan Reicher unquestionably has all the prerequisites suggested by former Speaker Sneddon and he will unquestionably make an excellent Speaker of the House. The spe the, uh, I need hardly remind honourable members and uh, lecture them on the, the, uh, the nature and history of the Speaker in the Westminster system. 
The reality is, however, that in the mother of parliaments, that impartiality that exudes from the Speaker's chair has not always occurred in this chamber, uh, particularly under this government. I, uh, I say to you that uh, you will search in vain, not merely for examples of uh, the member for Grainler naming any miscreant on the other side, but any Labor speaker ever, save and except for Speaker Cope, and we know what happened to him as a consequence, seeking to properly, within the standing orders of this parliament, deal with members from his own party. Mr Rocha, again on that test comes with clean hands, so clean that he named and had expelled the member for Franklin. <laughs> so one has a scalp on his belt, the other doesn't in terms of his own side. Now I say we've not always received that degree of impartiality which the parliament actually demands. And, uh, Alan Rocher exudes that impartiality, and it is with great pleasure, uh, albeit with little confidence, that I move that uh, he take the chair of the House as Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dobell. Thank you, Mr Browning. It's, uh, of course, a great honour to second the nomination of the Honourable Member for Grainler, Leo Maclay, the Speaker of the Australian Parliament. The office of Speaker brings with it many onerous responsibilities, the most difficult being keeping dignity in order in this chamber, sometimes in periods of extreme tension between members and parties. While serving with Senator Reg Withers on a parliamentary committee a few years ago, he offered me, as a relative newcomer, some pretty sound advice about this place. And he said, we're not here, you know, we're not here for a tea party, you know. It's a fight to the death to decide who will form the next government of Australia. This fight to the death this fight to the death, as Reg Withers called it, sometimes involves some pretty torrid exchanges in this House, and the first qualification needed by any candidate for Speaker is the ability to keep order by firm and fair decisions in this chamber. Leo uh, Maclay, in the last three and a half years as, as Chairman of Committees and Deputy Speaker, has demonstrated that he has already developed the toughness and earned the respect of both sides of this House which is needed to be Speaker. In particular, his work with the support of Speaker Joan Child to expand the role of the House of Representatives committee system is something which in the long term will significantly enhance the role of backbench members of this chamber and provide for a more rigorous examination of the executive and the public service. As a member of the Prime Minister's Task Force on Retirement Incomes, I uh, also had the pleasure of serving with the member for Grainler in a series of meetings around the country, and again he did a great job there. Before his election as chairman of committees, Mr Maclay, of course, was chairman of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Expenditure. His committee reports, including patronage power and the muse on funding for the arts, and his, his other report, in a home or at home, on the provision of care for the elderly, resulted in many changes, including the home and community care program, which has resulted in major reforms for elderly people. And I understand that he was even responsible for lobbying for a bit more money to be provided from uh, the funding going to opera and ballet to be redirected to our developing Australian rock industry, and that's something which I commend. And as his taste in music indicates, Leo Maclay will be one of the youngest speakers of this House at only 43 years of age. He was just listen, just listen, you'll learn something. He was born in working class Marrickville. And I'm proud to, and I'm happy to note that his parents, both of his parents, are sitting in the gallery this afternoon, with his wife Janice and younger son Martin. And I'm sure they're very proud of uh, their son and father and husband. Mr. and Mrs. McClay must be proud to see that their son, the product of the local parish primary school, St. Pius's, and like the treasurer and myself, the product of the firm authority of the De La Salle brothers, can can be nominated on this day into this chamber. And I hope for those opposite, opposite that Mr Maclay doesn't use the same firmness and discipline that was applied by the De La Salle brothers. <laughs> having, left school, having, having left school at year 10, Leo's uh, first job was as a telegram boy with, at Marrickville Post Office. And then after becoming a tele, telephone technician, working for Telecom, he worked very hard to be elected as the member for Grainler and has served his constituents with distinction ever since. 
I know that Leo Maclay won't forget his origins. He won't forget those people in Marrickville, and I'm sure that he will fulfil the office of Speaker and discharge its responsibilities with dignity and distinction. The Leader of the National Party. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Clark. I uh, have much pleasure in seconding the nomination of Alan Charles Rocha, yeah. and in doing so I must remark uh, with some amazement at the comments made by the member for Dobell. And I would suggest that he chose his quote uh, most inappropriately if he and the government have any real commitment to the traditions of Westminster yeah, government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For him in nominating a speaker to quote, to quote a partisan remark that reflects a commitment to partisan politics, I think is quite amazing. And I would hope, and I would, I would hope, and I would sincerely hope that uh, that should Mr. Uh, Maclay be successful in this ballot today, that he would recant from that remark, that he is prepared uh, to fight to the death to achieve uh, the election of a particular party to government. Because what is fundamentally important in this place and in all parliaments throughout this country is that we do have, we do have independence, and we do have a bipartisan approach from the chair. And regrettably. Regrettably, in recent times, that has not always been obvious. My colleague, the uh, Leader of the Opposition, spoke uh, at some length about the qualities that Speaker Sneddon identified as being important for a speaker. And he spoke of uh, a person needing the highest integrity. When it comes to Alan Roach's integrity, there can be no question. When it comes to his judgment, there, of course, can be no, no question at all. And we saw an example of that only in this place in the other evening in his handling of a very sensitive incident in this parliament involving a member of the government, uh, where he, uh, he chose to take a very mature approach and uh, an independent approach to ensure that there was no embarrassment caused to the parliament. And of course that highlights his common sense, which of course again is a fundamental quality required by a speaker. Mr, Mr Browning, as I've said, these qualities are needed more than ever because of the events that have taken place in this parliament in recent months and recent years. Never before, to my knowledge, in the history of this parliament have we had documents prepared which refer to the decline of question time, documents with a title that says the decline of question time in the Hawke era, blood sports and media events. What we need is a speaker, a speaker who will address the need to make this parliament more relevant and more in tune with the community. And Mr Rocha will, of course, address those problems. He would, of course, recognise the need to ensure that questions are not only asked in accordance with standing orders, but that answers are given in accordance with standing orders. And he would do something about perhaps the excesses of the Treasurer in terms of the length and relevance of his answers, and perhaps even address the Treasurer's language. And of course, we, we, on, this, and we, on, this, we on this side we, we on this side would not resile from his total commitment to, install, to enforcing the standing orders with impartiality on both sides of the chamber. And of course, of course the, the quality required is of a speaker to do something about the abuse of Dorothy Dixes, which increasingly in this place are used as, used as a substitute for parliamentary statements. And I'm sure that someone with the understanding of standing orders and the commitment to the parliament and the Westminster system that Mr Rocha has would address that problem. There is an urgent need in the lead-up to the election to ensure that this parliament remains relevant to the Australian community, that question time fulfils its appropriate role, and that is that it's an opportunity for information to be sought and information to be provided, but for it no longer to be a media stunt or blood sports or the substitution of statements which provided for in other places in standing order as an attempt, as an attempt to, to, to prevent uh, the genuine seeking of information from the opposition. It is important that question time become orderly, that, uh, that all members, including members of the backbench, have an opportunity to pose their questions. Mr Browning, I have no hesitation in commending Mr Roche's nomination to the House. I find him eminently qualified for the position. The member, honourable member for O'Connor. Yes, thank you, Mr Browning. Mr Browning, it was interesting to re hear the member for Lindsay remarks in which he talked about outstanding contribution, sound record and fairly and firmly. Well, let's think, see what the Canberra Times had to say about some of those things on Tuesday, October the 25th, and it's a pity that your caucus did not read this particular newspaper in 1988, if that would suit you, on this particular matter, and I quote, the performance of Mr Maclay is not good enough 
for Australia's federal parliament. It has been that way for more than two years. However, there is no excuse for the occupant of the chair not knowing the standing orders and sessional orders of the House and the names of the electorates and in which members represent them. Mr Maclay has consistently shown that he does not have this knowledge. That's the person that your caucus has decided to inflict on this parliament. But that would not be the end of it. The Canberra Times, who are they, says the Prime Minister. That's a good one for the record. <laughs> Let's get... Yeah. Let's go a little bit further and look at the words of Derek Park who's a well-known political scientist, when he wrote in the Current Affairs Bulletin on April 89 the following. Given that the duration of question time has remained static, how can the number of questions have dropped? And of course, this article is dealing with the Hawke government, uh, dealing with question time. The answer is clearly that the government's answers, especially to questions from its own backbench, have become longer. In the 1987 budget sitting, 88 autumn sitting period, 206 replies exceeded 750 words, with about a quarter of those exceeding 1,000 words. Of the eight replies which exceed 1,800 words, taking about 20 minutes, out of 45 minutes of question time, five are from Mr Keating, Mr Verbosity himself. Pity there's no substance in the words. The standing orders, of course, do not stipulate, sit down, Kim, you're half the cause of it. Come on, I'm only reading a quote. The point of order uh, is that under the standing orders for the debate on the, on the election of a speaker, there is a requirement for the debate to be relevant. Uh, the debate here oh, is the debate is here. The and for leaders of the House not here, to waste time. But the points being raised here by the member for O'Connor are points that are made to the conduct of, speak, of question time, points when Mr Maclay nor Mr Rocha, the two candidates, have been in the chair. I would submit, therefore, that the detail in which the debate is taking place does not go to the character of either Mr Maclay or Mr Rocha and is therefore irrelevant to the debate. Well, I, I would say in, in, this is an, a direct quote of how question time operates, Mr Browning. And the standing orders, of course, I quote uh, from Mr excuse, Park. Excuse me, if I could just rule on the point of order. Uh, it places a, me in a very difficult position, as no, you, would. the House would realise. Uh, but I think uh, the member can continue in the vein that he's been Thank going. you very much. Yeah. Might I add by their Wonderful. squeals, would you know them? Continuing, continuing my quote, continuing the quote of Mr Derek Park in the Current Affairs Bulletin, he says, the standing orders, of course, do not stipulate the length of answers, so it is effectively left up to the speaker. Very long answers, however, obviously limit opposition opportunities by reducing the overall number of questions. It is a tactic which can only work with the Speaker's approval, and thus his or her agreement to a partisan strategy, which involves a denial of what question time is for, the asking of questions. Now, that's the indictment from two independent commenters, commentators the editor of the Canberra Times and Mr Derek Park, about the person who this government has chosen to inflict on this parliament. You can always rely on my behaving myself when you do. And that is the point that is most necessary to be known. You are the people who are abusing the parliament, and of course you as the Leader of House take most responsibility from that. If you get off your speaker's back, there may be a chance that they'll have the opportunity to do their duty in the way that Speaker Steddon once said it should be done. The honourable member for Paul. Move again. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Cornwall. 
Mr. Browning, I want to strongly support the nomination of Leo Maclay for this position, and I want to and I want to say a couple of things. I want to say a couple of things. Point of order, Mr. Mr. Browning. I take vigorous exception, and I hope every member of the House would. From this interjection over here, have you got an interpreter? An absolutely despicable interjection. Absolutely despicable. Uh, absolutely despicable. The member for call. Actually, the Prime Minister's comment goes to the point that I wanted to make in relation to Leo Maclay, and that is that irrespective of the factional differences, let me say that Leo Maclay has been one of the strongest supporters of multiculturalism in Australia and has supported, continuously, has supported all actions in favour of multiculturalism and his work for the various ethnic communities, not only in his own electorate, but throughout Australia has been outstanding in relation to that. And let me say that at a time when many people opposite could do well to recognise that Australia consists of people from all over the world and we are a multicultural society, Leo Maclay has, I think in his work, put forward a great deal and done a lot to promote that cause. And in that regard, he will be a speaker that represents not merely, not merely the members of this House, but also the totality of the Australian people, because he is cognisant of the fact that it is a multicultural society and that we consist of people who have come from many other uh, places. And while I'm on my feet, can I just make a comment, uh, Mr Browning, about the abuse of question time? Because we have heard a lot from the opposition. But one of the things that I am not aware of in any democratic country is the claim, which is constantly made by the member for O'Connor, that it is not possible for a member, uh, for a minister, in answering a question, to compare the policies of the opposition and the government. If that, if that approach, if that determination were to go down, which has never gone down, it would, it would be an aberration of democracy. And the continuous interjections by the member for O'Connor on this point are out of order. They have been out of order all the time, and he is the one who's dis been disrupting the parliament. In accordance with the standing order, the bells will be rung and a ballot taken. Coming from you, Wilson, who on our side is going to have to tell lies to elect Leah? <laughs>
Ballot papers will now be distributed. Will honourable members please write on the ballot paper the name of the candidate for whom they wish to vote. The candidates are Mr Maclay and Mr Rocher.
Pictures. Okay, then. Ten, twenty. The result of the ballot is Mr Maclay 78, Mr Rocher 60, Mr Maclay is declared elected. I wish to express my grateful thanks to the House for the high honour that you have been pleased to confer upon me. Thank you all very much. The Honourable the Prime Minister. May I very briefly, both personally and on behalf of uh, this side of the House, offer our sincere congratulations to you on the achievement of this high office, and I join with the Honourable Member who nominated you in uh, expressing the same view that your family I must be extraordinarily proud of you and of your achievement. Uh, what you have done before coming to the chair has been uh, adequately described on this side of the House. It's a career which uh, commenced in the area of local government and in your time in this place you have uh, been uh, a person who has displayed a considerable interest in, involvement in, commitment to a wide range of uh, areas of interest of importance to uh, your constituents, and I must particularly from my own experience, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, refer to two areas. As has been said, you were one of the co-chairmen of my uh, task force on retirement incomes and the work that uh, you did in that capacity played a significant part in the involvement of the uh, wide-ranging policies that the government has been able to adopt with wide approbation in that area, and I thank you for that. And of course also, Mr Speaker, I've been in your electorate with you and have seen your absolute commitment to uh, the interests of all sections of your community and your particular interest in trying to ensure that those who have come from overseas to Australia to make this their new home uh, should be made welcome in this country and uh, yeah. I think we are all indebted to you for that uh, particular area of interest. So you come to the Chair, uh, Mr Speaker, with great experience, great commitment, great integrity and appropriately wide range of interests which gives you a feel for uh, the real interests and aspirations of uh, the Australian people and uh, therefore personally as I say and on behalf of the government I congratulate you and wish you well. I hope Mr Speaker that you would allow me also briefly the opportunity of paying tribute um, to your predecessor 
Joan Child, as has been said already in this House, uh, the words I used in the uh, caucus this morning uh, were to say to Joan, honourable member for Henty, uh, that she made history and she made it well. And uh, all our respect, regard and affection uh, goes to you, uh, uh, the honourable member for Henty, Joan, and uh, we uh, thank you for the job that you've done over many years, and most particularly in your job as Speaker. And, uh, we wish you uh, every good thing for the future in this place and beyond. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker Maclay, there are only, uh, as I cast around, I think only four of us, of all the members in this uh, chamber, who uh, served under a previous Speaker Maclay. He, of course, of different weight, and of different persuasion. But uh, we congratulate you and we trust that uh, by some form of osmosis or reconstruction that you may take the view of the former Speaker Maclay, who was in fact one who practised his position with great impartiality, tact and wisdom. We of course uh, commiserate uh, with uh, the member for, Fre uh, for member for Curtin, who uh, came to the position nominated uh, with great qualifications but few expectations today, we wish you well. We believe, of course, uh, in this great institution. The focal point in our democracy are the debates in the chambers of the House of Representatives uh, and the Senate. You inherit a very great tradition, which I trust you will execute uh, in your duties according to the rules, standing orders, conventions and traditions. May I say personally to you that for all your feeling of satisfaction in being elected, as you survey the gallery, it must give you that warm additional pleasure to see and sense that degree of satisfaction that your family must feel today. And on these occasions, um, we join in congratulating you and say to them that we share, in a sense, the satisfaction of a family uh, rejoicing in the elevation to a great post that uh, you have risen today. Uh, party differences may divide us, but your occupancy of that position, as I say, is an occupancy of very great tradition and convention, and we look to you to uphold it and wish you and your family all the best. May I also join with the Prime Minister uh, in indicating to your predecessor, sir, in wishing uh, the member for Henty well. We have, and we can't rewrite history, we have disagreed with a number of her rulings, but we hold her in the highest personal regard, and this is the first step in the process of two steps toward her retirement from this chamber. And I would wish on the occasion of the first step, namely retirement from the position of Speaker, before she retires from the House of Representatives at the next election, to thank her, uh, to wish her the best of health and enjoyment in whatever she pursues after her retirement from this House, and to wish her and her family well. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I wish to, uh, on behalf of the uh, National Party, associate myself and my party with the remarks made by the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. We extend to you uh, congratulations on your election as Speaker and look forward to uh, working with you in this place to ensure that the traditions of the Parliament are upheld in an independent way. I would also like to uh, comment on uh, your predecessor, the member for Henty, Mrs Child. I think all in this place understand the determination and uh, diligence that was demonstrated by Joan Child in her political career, which spans many years, and the personal sacrifices that she made uh, in support of her sons and uh, to further her career. And as the Leader of the Opposition has said, we haven't always agreed with her rulings, but we have always respected her position in the chair. And might I just say to you, Joan, that I think it was particularly appropriate that you went out on a very high note and that in your last day in the chair, in your last question time, you sat the Treasurer down.
order. <laughs> Could I? Oh, the honourable member for Curtin. Mr. Speaker, I add my congratulations to you on your election. It's uh, with the utmost goodwill that I express the hope that you will uh, merit the support of the House in your important work and, as a consequence, enjoy the respect of all honourable members. As I have had uh, the occasion to say once before in echoing the sentiments of Speaker Peel in, when he said to the House of Commons, without the support of the House, a Speaker can do nothing. With that support, there is little he cannot do. Given your experience as chairman of committees, you'll appreciate those words more than most. Although your conduct of proceedings in this chamber will be the criterion on which your contribution will be publicly judged, there's other equally important work. In tandem with Mr President, you are required to oversee the management of Parliament House and precincts. It's not generally known that that task involves management of a budget, an annual budget, which exceeds amounts appropriated to run some government departments. That side of your duties should account for a greater amount of your time than the time you actually spend in the House, usually without the publicity of the kind to be generated while you, while you occupy the chair. There remains plenty to do or be settled in the running of this Parliament House, Mr Speaker. Not the least of your problems will be remedying the dearth of and the conditions of employment of Hansard reporters. Whether that problem is the result of the amalgamation of the Parliamentary Reporting Service into and subordinate to the Joint House Committee is a matter for you. Ultimately, of course, it's a matter for the Parliament. I wish you well in resolving that and recurring problems with catering and uh, provision of other services, many of an industrial relations kind. Mr Speaker, being amongst the first to formally congratulate her on her election to the Speakership in February 1986, I'm pleased to have an opportunity to pay my respects to, uh, to the Honourable Member for Henty on her abdication premature though it is. She's distinguished herself in this place both as a person and a speaker. I have had uh, more than one occasion to share and appreciate her friendly good humour and, uh, and I won't uh, refer to a trip we uh, each went on, a delegation we each went on to France uh, in any detail. <laughs> I don't know if uh, ill health contributed to, uh, to her decision, Mr Speaker, a decision I regret, incidentally, but if that is the case, I hope that ill health will not linger on too long. May, uh, may she enjoy a more relaxed time for the remainder of this, her last term in the parliament, and retire in good health to enjoy her family, friends and uh, less dedicated pursuits. Order. Could I thank the House from the bottom of my heart for the honour that you have paid me and my family. I'd also like to thank you for the honour that you've done my electorate of Grainler, which is one of the most ethnically diverse electorates in the whole of Australia. There have only been four members for my electorate since it was first created. And I thank the House for allowing me to make my mark up there with Fred Daly, Frank Stewart and Tony Whitlam. I'd like to thank the members for Lindsay and Doe Bell and Corwell for their remarks in support of my candidature and I'm pleased to see that their eloquence swayed the House. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Leader of the National Party and the member for Curtin for their remarks. I can assure the member for Curtin that I value his friendship and I uh, see no uh, um, competition in, in him uh, running for this office. When I was thinking of what... Uh, to, <coughs> I, I suppose I should have put that a different way. I see, I see no animosity in him running for this office. 
in the, because in the 10 years that I've been a member of this parliament, I've made friends on both sides and I hope that I can continue to rely on those friends for advice. When I was sitting in my office this morning thinking what I should say today, I glanced at my desk calendar and uh, the motto on the desk calendar was that he that is overcautious will accomplish very little. That of course reminded me of the old saying which says that he who makes no mistakes learns little. So I just hope that my friends on both sides will ensure that in the first month or two of my holding this office that I neither learn too much nor accomplish too much. <laughs> the member for Dobell in his remarks mentioned that I had started my career as a telegram boy at Marrickville Post Office. And I can say that it is a long way from Marrickville Post Office to the high office of Speaker of the House of Representatives. But what it does say to the people of my electorate is that in Australia we still can be whatever we wish to be. And for the people who live in my electorate who have come from many countries around the globe where there's no such thing as parliamentary democracy, that the fact that someone who's lived and grown up with them can reach this high office is of merit. I'd also, if the House would allow me, like to make a few remarks about my good friend, the member for Henty. In joining with the Prime Minister and other speakers, I'd like to say how the bond of friendship I've had with her over the last three years as her deputy has made me feel a very lucky person. I'd particularly like to thank her for giving me the opportunity to hold this high office. I think the best way that one could sum up Joan Child is if I read into the record the editorial in the, Sydney in the Telegraph in Sydney this morning, which was entitled End of an Era. And that editorial said, she reached the top through sheer grit and feminine tenacity. She was not fired by political ambition, but by a fierce sense of humane justice. Her political career was sparked by anger during the Vietnam War, and life was not easy for Joan Child. Widowed in 1965, she worked hard to rear her five sons, and she epitomises the true fighting spirit of the Aussie battler. She worked on a factory assembly line as a hospital cook and a cleaner, and rose from those humble jobs to one of the highest offices in the land. Mrs Child is an inspirational example to all women. She showed that a woman has a place in the house as well as in the home. I'd like to say to the house, I think that's the best way I've heard or thought that one could sum up our dear friend Joan Child. I'd thank the house once again for the honour you have bestowed on me. And like Joan said in her acceptance speech for the office of speaker, I can assure all members that my door will be open to all of you. I hope you will help me to do my job and I assure you that I'll do my job, this job to the best of my ability and with the fairness that you all demand. I thank you very much. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I have ascertained that it would be the uh, Governor-General's pleasure to receive you in the Members' Hall in a few moments.